Hey everyone, Marcos Pereira Velares here. It's good to see you guys again. And today we're going to go over what we would have done on our advanced club side. Again, we have a fundamental side, which is a video we posted yesterday, and an advanced side of club. If we were in person, these would be occurring at the same time, just in different sections of the room. So the fundamentals club of what we did yesterday is more for the people that are newer to the Gonset system and what they need to do to get the fundamental baseline foundation for what we do and how we go about our thinking process. This advanced side is once you've kind of graduated from that fundamental understanding and you really understand the system through and through and how to go deeper into much more advanced situations when you have patience. So what we're going to start by doing is going through our first step of our analysis, which is a thorough case history. This is where the patient is sitting across from you and you're getting all of the information about their symptomatology, their mechanism of injury, everything that goes into what their subjective understanding is how this problem happened. So in this case history, when we're hearing what the patient's saying, the first thing going through our head is what sympathetic or parasympathetic system is this in? Okay, so we have the autonomic nervous system, which we've talked about before, and those are the two branches, the sympathetic and parasympathetic. Through Dr. Gonstead's millions of patients and years of practice of having the best chiropractic practice to ever be on the face of this earth, he actually found through pretty much the biggest control trial there is that through from C5 up to the occiput is considered a parasympathetic region and have a parasympathetic effect on the body. The same thing goes for L5, the sacrum, ilium, and coccyx. That also was determined that adjusting these segments would have a parasympathetic effect on the patient, okay? And the sympathetic region was C6, again to L5. L5 is kind of that wild card that could do both, so it's very important to analyze on both situations. So when you have a parasympathetic subluxation, we actually see muscle spasm and sharper pain. And then also we get to see increased speed of an organ because that parasympathetic, that break, isn't working as well. Another thing we get to see is that pain happens later in the day or headaches happen later in the day as opposed to in the morning. These are all problems that are associated with parasympathetic subluxations. Now, muscle spasms can happen in a sympathetic region, but that is more of a compensation for hypermobile segments as opposed to the cause of the issue. So again, we're finding the cause, not the effect. All right, that's our goal. By having these symptomatologies, we can backtrack to the cause by understanding whether this is a sympathetic or parasympathetic subluxation. Another thing we get in this case history is what is physiologically going on? Are the kidneys the cause, the liver, the stomach, the thyroid gland, the adrenal gland? There are so many different causes that can make a symptom appear. So again, backtracking and understanding which nerve goes to which organs and which regions is a very important in your case history as the patient's telling you what the problem is. There are also symptom and vertebrate correlations that we get to see in the Gonstead work that have, again, from Dr. Gonstead's millions and millions of patients he's seen, he noticed some trends of certain symptomatologies with certain vertebra correlations. So what he saw was, it. so these symptom vertebra correlations will be seen in the attachment that's also posted with this video that can help you look at. And if you look at the biomechanics of the spine and the pelvis and how things are made to work, you can understand why patients say this is the symptoms they're feeling and why it makes sense of the cause of those symptomatology. All right, so now after we get through that thorough case history, we get into the next step of our analysis, and that is instrumentation. Dr. Mize will go over instrumentation in a pit very thoroughly and very in depth coming soon. So just wait for that. But for these purposes today, we're gonna to show you how to use instrumentation in this area of the spine, okay? And it can also help point you in a direction whether it's an ilium or a sacrum. Another very important thing about the Gonstead system is we use every single piece, all six parts of case history, visualization, static palpation, motion palpation, instrumentation, and x-ray analysis to point us into the direction of what the cause is. We don't hold anyone to a higher standard. We compile everything together and see what is telling us to go in this direction most, okay? So what we're gonna do now is show you some instrumentation using the Nervoscope or the Delta T, any dual probe instrument that requires constant contact with the spine. 
and how to use this to help you determine, okay? So when you have a patient, they're going to be seated in the cervical chair with the back down. I'm just doing this for purposes of showing. So what we're gonna do is if you can see the scope and where the nerves come out of the spine, if we're too wide, we're gonna miss the nerve roots. So what we have to do is bring this instrument in and lock it with an inner position or actually parallel, you can use either. So with the patient seated, we are going to start by scoping down the patient's spine, okay? As we scope down the patient's spine, you notice if we're getting too wide, our probes will be over the ilium. So again, that means we have to come in and narrow up these probes, okay? So now the probes are narrower. As we're scoping down, we're looking for the deflection of the scope. And again, those in the advanced club know what that deflection is. Those for the fundamental clubs, just wait for Dr. Meisel to go over this in our first online pit, okay? So as we're scoping down the spine, we're waiting to see where the break is. So if the break is breaking towards the right right now, all the way down here, now we can scope the SI joints. Again, it's very important to notice that the SI joint is from S1, 2, and 3. And then we can know from there whether it's an SI joint or is even a sacral tubercle down at S4 or S5. So it's very important to know the anatomy of the spine. So as we're breaking, say we get a break right here at S2. Now we're going to examine that a little bit further. If the break is off to the right, I'm going to narrow my probes even more. So I'm down, break to the right. Now I'm gonna scope on either end of the SI joint. If the break goes still to the right, this is telling me that it's more likely that the ilium is subluxated as opposed to the sacrum. However, if I'm scoping down here and the break is to the left towards the sacrum, that's telling us that we might have a sacral subluxation. And it's very important that when we're scoping down the patient's spine, we go all the way down to the coccyx. If you don't go all the way down to the coccyx, you might miss an S4, S5, or even a coccyx subluxation. Also, when we're scoping right here, we might get a break at the L5-S1 disc space. That L5-S1 disc space could be an L5 subluxation, a base posterior, or even a PI ilium, because when this rocks PI, you're gonna get swelling and edema up at the top of this joint, and it can make a reading happen all the way up at that disc space. So again,